mental illness, what the Bible has to say, and, and really we're just, we're looking at some individuals that definitely showed characteristics of mental illness, and uh, uh, we already talked about Nebuchadnezzar, he's probably the, the biggest one in scripture, I mean he lost his mind for seven years, he's out there eating grass like an ox, uh, his hair's growing so thick it looks like he's got feathers on his back, his, his, his uh, fingernails have turned into claws, I mean he, he looked like an animal. And no doubt it was some spiritual influence that uh, led him to that point. Um, and that, that brings up the thing about these devils, that somehow they're connected with animals and or animal spirits. I'm not saying, I think there's some devilment involved, there's some angel, fallen angels involved with that, I don't know how. Um, but they seem to, they seem to, the one they seem to get a hold of, they seem to turn them into an animal like the maniacs of Gadara, at least the one maniac that we're told the most about, um, he's acting like an animal. He was living like an animal and crying and cutting himself. And, you know, I mean, he, he's doing more than that. Now he's acting like a religious Catholic, <laughs> you know, when he's cutting himself and doing penance and all that good thing. You ever think about all that stuff, you know, whether there's a, you know, when you start hurting yourself, there's something wrong with that. It's just a, just a problem, I think. Uh, and I'm not saying it could not just be your emotions, but I've never understood that. I've wanted to hurt some other people. You know, I, I can got so angry I wanted to hurt somebody else, but the last person I always wanted to hurt was me. You know, I mean, you know, um, I, I, don't even, I don't even hit walls because they're too hard. They hurt my knuckles. They caused them to bleed. They, and it, <laughs> you know, walls hit back. And I don't hit people either, because that hurts my hands too. I'm, I'm, I consider myself pretty non-violent, but it, the last person I want to hurt is myself. But you know, maybe I'm just selfish. Um, anyway, let's let's talk about some, a few more people that uh, um, had some issues, and one of them was faking it, faking being mad. Who knows who that is? David. Yep, David. Look in um, 1 Samuel chapter 21. But there is something here. He's faking it all right, but there's something that drives him to do this. I mean, this is extreme for David. We're talking about, listen, we're talking about a guy that took out Goliath. We're talking about a guy who, who, who the song goes, da uh, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Now, whether that number's accurate or it's just kind of how the song rolls, you <laughs> know, um, David, David was a, a mighty warrior. And it says here in 1 Samuel 21, verse 10, this is when David had to flee uh, Saul. Saul's after him. Now, David's just a general, kind of like a general at this point. But uh, he's been anointed of the Lord, and Saul knows it. And Saul's been out to kill him for a while. And uh, David ends up fleeing into the hands of uh, the Philistines. It says, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. That's the Philistines. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him and dance a saying, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. I mean, he has landed in any ter enemy territory where they know the song. That, he's can, that he has uh, been credited with killing ten thousands of them. And it says he was sore afraid. Now, you can ask yourself, and, and, and what could David have done besides what he did? Could have trusted God, right? And he's thinking, well, how's God going to get me out of this? Well, God can get you out of anything. You know, when Abimelech was about, I believe it was Abimelech, was about to take uh, Abraham's wife, Sarah, the Lord came to him in dreams and said, Thou art all but a dead man. And I think he could have done the same thing to the, the, uh, this king here. God can protect whoever he wants to protect. He doesn't have a problem with it. He's not up there wringing his hands going, How am I going to do this? But in our mind, man, we're looking for any way out. And fear, that's, that's the thing I'm here. It says he was sore afraid. I mean, he's afraid right down to his toes. And fear will make you do things you never thought you could do. It's, 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 
it in itself is destabilizing to the mind. And it says there in verse 13, And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. I mean, this is a sight, man. This is the future king of Israel, and he, he, he's going around and he's acting like he's nuts. You know, he's got spit going down, you know. <laughs> he's just acting. I can't do a good act like that, but... Uh, just acting like he's crazy. And evidently, he's pretty good at it. Um, it says there, verse 14, Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. <laughs> Wherefore then have you brought him unto me? What would you bring him to me for? He's nuts. Have I need of a madman? That ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? That this fellow, uh, uh, shall this fellow come into my house? Which kind of tells you that, you know, just like today, we like to take mental people that are mental patients and put them somewhere other than our house and put them somewhere from us. We don't want them in our presence. We don't want them because it's too difficult to deal with. And if you've ever de dealt with folks that uh, have lost their mental acuity <laughs> or they got mental problems, it is tough. Don't kid yourself one bit. Till you've lived with one for a while, you don't know, or you've had to deal with one for a while, you have no idea of uh, the strain and the stress it can put you under. And this king saying, what's this fellow? And it, here's the thing. He missed his opportunity. He could have killed David. David goes on to be the king of Israel. And what does David do? Goes right after those Philistines. Missed his opportunity there. But David's put on a pretty good act. Now, I think this is a low point in David's life. We all have them. Where maybe we didn't rise... You know, rise to the occasion of being a, 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 a brave and, and um, um, I don't know. Noble yeah, a noble warrior. There you go. This is kind of less than noble. I imagine he wanted to put it behind him. I don't think anybody ever mentioned it to him. But the thing you can get out of that thing when you're reading is fear is debilitating. No pun intended. He had let it debilitate him to where he was acting like a madman. Now, remember what, uh, you remember what uh, Joab said, let us play the man. <laughs> and here it says let, he played the madman. <laughs> Less than honorable. Um, notice that the Philistines recognized the madness when they saw it. This was not something that, that was unheard of. They recognized it right away. This man's mad. He's lost his mind. Um, let's look at another one here. And this one is, uh, we're, he's not faking it, but the Lord has something to do with it. Look in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19. And, you know, David's being chased by Saul, and, and, David, uh, and David has to act like he's crazy. And Saul's chasing after David, and God kind of makes him look crazy. In other words, you know, you think God can mess with all your, 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 your... He can mess with your mind, too. And I think that would be the worst judgment. I mean, you know, if, if he... You know, if he starts uh, hacking off limbs, that's one thing. But when he takes your mind, man, he, he, he's, he's pretty much done you in. And God can mess with your mind. He, he's done that throughout, uh, throughout Scripture. He can, he can make a man think something, see something. Or we, we covered a verse over there in Job where it looked like that God could come to him in the night and put thoughts in his head. Now, God's not altering your free will, but don't think he can't persuade you. Don't think he can't get you thinking something and doing something that he wants you to do if it's to his advantage and his glory. And look at this in 1 Samuel 19. Uh, look at verse 20. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. Now, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Um, uh, in Dr. Ruckman's ad lib, the closest thing you can get to it is he has, these, he has them prophesying like they're a um, bunch of charismatics or something, you know, and they're just uh, <laughs> they're just kind of acting they're, they're, they're unstable and acting crazy. And 
It says that when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. I mean, he's sending these messengers to find out where David and Samuel are. And somehow God short-circuits that by causing them to prophesy. And that's why I don't... Anybody got a clue what's going on here? Uh, it says, And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. Well, boy, they prophesy. And what, what's, what's the point of it here? What's going on? It said, Then went he, then went he also to, to Ramah, this is Saul, and came to a great well that is in Siku, and he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be at Naoth in Ramah. And he went thither to Naoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. So now, Saul, who's seeking him, he finally goes to where he thinks they are, where he's told they are, and he starts prophesying. But look what happens in the next verse. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Now, I can't, I, I can't, I just think that God was messing with him. The Spirit of God was messing with his mind. I mean, you know, listen, one of the things that when insta mental instability, I'm not trying to say mental illness, but mental instability, people start taking off their clothes. Uh, having talked to one that worked in one of those wards for years, and he would tell me about different situations. He never gave me names except for a couple that we knew. And the one thing that every one of them did was strip. Why is that? Because there's something about that. There's something about that spiritual influence that causes them to take off their clothes. So, and, and Saul is taking off his clothes here publicly. Um, man, I'll tell you what. And stays that way for, you know, for a whole day. You say, well, what's going on? Well, Saul's after David. David is God's anointed now. He's anointed him king. He's rejected Saul as king. So you know what God does? God humiliates Saul. Look, look at Proverbs 21.1. And I, I think this verse might kind of sum it up for us here. Of what's going on here. I don't know exactly uh, the actions that are taking place here. I don't quite understand, to be honest with you. Um, but when you prophesy, that, that's the Spirit of God speaking through you. Well, here the Spirit of God is causing Saul to act like he's nuts. Proverbs 21.1, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. And I think... I think the Lord was just letting Saul know, you can go after David all you want, but your heart's in my hand. And I'll do whatever I want with you. That's true with any of us. You know, we can, we can, we can say, you know, I'm going to do this, but we know good and well we're supposed to say, if the Lord will. Because he can sure stop you in a heartbeat. And I think he was letting Saul know that, and it didn't matter who Saul sent. The Spirit of God just kind of just canceled him right there. And then when Saul himself shows up, he cancels Saul, really makes a, really humiliates him. And this thing about, is Saul among the prophets? I don't, I don't quite understand that. I guess they're kind of bewildered that, you know, is he, a, I mean, he's prophesying. I don't know what he's prophesying, you know. Maybe he's given the hugs, you know, and, and the Lord said, the, you know, who knows what he's doing. And, uh, but they're, 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 everybody's just kind of bewildered, <laughs> like I am, about what actually went on there. So, look at uh, Exodus chapter 5. Let's look at Pharaoh. This is not one necessarily of humiliation or, or acting. This is someone who has, uh, he's not right upstairs. He's just not right. And the problem with that is he's ruling over you. Um, when you get someone that's not right upstairs and they're ruling over you, and, I, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't bring this up on purpose, but we're in trouble. We're in trouble. 
especially when they're wielding power. Um, and in this case, Pharaoh's wielding power. Look at Exodus 5, 1 to 2. Exodus 5, 1 to 2, and it says, uh, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that uh, they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So the first thing that Pharaoh does is harden his heart. And that's really what we're talking about here, a, a, a hard-hearted person. And you say, well, you know, he really didn't know who the Lord was, and, and, but as he begins to know who the Lord is, okay, uh, he had already hardened his heart, so God just keeps hardening it even further. Uh, he wouldn't let Israel go. Um, Proverbs 29, 2 says this, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. And that is, uh, when you got a wicked ruler, when you got someone that's uh, uh, wielding power, like they, they, they got a hold of their, uh, their daddy's firearm that they found in the house, you know, a 12-year-old, and wielding power like that, they're usually very destructive to their own people. And we're going to find out, man, this guy, man, he, was, he, he practically destroyed his nation. Um, when they find, listen, when, when, when the Israelites finally get out of there, the Bible tells us in Exodus 12, 37, there were 600,000 men besides children. Now, I don't know if he's including the women with the men. Maybe, I don't know. But you're still looking at, when you start counting the children, you're still looking at between 2 and 3 million people. Probably 2 million. 2 million people that are on the march. And this guy decides to go after them. Now, you don't go after two million people with a couple hundred soldiers. <laughs> you have to mobilize your entire army. This is, after, this is after the God that these people serve has devastated your nation. I'm telling you, you're not right upstairs. There's something mentally wrong with you. And I think we can see that in Pharaoh. Now, the Lord just keeps hard in his heart because he knows that, he knows that Pharaoh is a narcissist. He's a narcissist. He is, he, is so, um, he is so intent on having his way and having power and not being opposed that he'll let the entire nation fall before he will back down. That's not what kind of ruler you want. You know, th that kind of happened with Israel when, when God told Jeremiah, you go and tell him, he said, you tell him to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar to save life. And they wouldn't do it. They defied, they, they just refused. After God said, look, I'm going to give them into your hand. You, this is not, you know, uh, uh, where you become a traitor to your country and you surrender. And you, this is God telling Jeremiah, you're done. I'm going to give you over into the hand of your enemies. Surrender and save your lives. That was Jeremiah's message to Israel. They wouldn't do it. Hardened heart. And as a result... Man, they, they killed thousands, maybe even millions. I'm not sure at that time. Um, a hardened heart is a heart that's stubborn or obstinate. Uh, it says in 1 Samuel 15, 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And it says it is as. It's a... It's, 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 is idolatry serious? Yes. So is stubbornness. And that's what they're being. They're being stubborn. They're being obstinate. They're being hard-hearted. Um, when he says, he says, Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also hath rejected thee from being king. Now he said that, I believe he said that to Saul, but he more or less said that to Pharaoh too. Because he said, let my people go. Um, being hard-hearted is a condition of the soul and the spirit. In uh, Psalm 78, verse 7 and 8, uh, it says that they, may, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his command, commandments, and, not, and might not be as their fathers a, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, 
and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. It gets right down to the soul and spirit. Stubbornness and rebellion. Israel was guilty of that, and so was Pharaoh. Uh, there's stubbornness and, re uh, and rebellion is... When, you've ever, when you run into someone that is given to that kind of thing, I mean, every now and then, you know, there's a, a streak of rebellion. I'm talking about a real rebel. You know, you don't want to be around those kind of people. He'll get you killed. Never in the Bible, you know, and this is never in the Bible are you told to be a rebel, ever. You're told to be obedient. And you're told to be obedient to the, to the very highest power, to God. So that you're never, you're never rebelling against anything. You're always in obedience to something. Does that make sense to you? Do you see that? Because if you, if you understand that, you're always an obedient servant. Even when maybe the government doesn't think so. But you're being obedient to God. It's their problem. They don't understand, they don't understand what the higher power dictates. It's their problem, not yours. Now, they'll try to make it your problem, I know, but you're just told to be obedient. But a stubborn and rebellious... Listen, God hated that thing so much. Now, listen to this. Look, look at Deuteronomy 21. When somebody gets to thinking that way, that uh, hard-heartedness, that stubbornness, that rebellious spirit, um, it carries through to the rest of their life. Because he's addressing... Uh, really, he's addressing children here, and I don't think these are children in the sense that they're under the age of 12. I think these are teenage. Listen, you weren't, you weren't a man that could go out to war until you were 20 in the Bible. America got it wrong at 18. Now, I know why they chose 18. Because they're fresh out of school, they haven't started a family, haven't got married. It was to save money. But no kid is a man ready to go to war at 18. If God tells them you number 20 years and older, that's where you start. You're not going to tell me that God doesn't know. But that's exactly what we, you know, put them in uniform at 18, send them out, too young. But I know why our government didn't want to do that, because they're afraid they're going to get out of school, get hitched, and start a family, and that complicates things, you know. Um, but look at Deuteronomy 21, look at verse 18. It says, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother. Now, I'm assuming this, he's either under the age of 20, okay, and I don't think by much, but he's living in their home, I would imagine, because he's, he's not obeying their voice, uh, that when they have chastened him, well, he's still under, you know, corporal punishment, I guess. I guess when they get older, you got to come up with uh, bigger weapons <laughs> other than just a, a paddle or... Um, and when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his, of, of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. I don't think that's a 12-year-old. If it is, you ought to take the parents out with him and stone them while you're at it. I'm assuming this is, uh, you know, 18, 19, 17, 18, 19, 20-year-old, or 19-year-old. Um, and it says, He is a glutton and a drunkard, and all of the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So what kind of God do you serve in there? One that can save lives and save a generation. Because it says there, So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear, and what? The proper fear. If we would just do this as a nation and put to death some of these rapists and everything, we'd probably stop rape, or at least we'd, a good portion of it. But we won't do it. And we'll hardly put them in jail. I mean, you've got serial rapists, serial killers. That means they just, they just keep going in line. <laughs> Why? Because, well, we just think that, you know, uh, violence shouldn't beget violence. According to who? According to God, if, if they're violent with somebody, uh, some innocent person, you're to get violent with them. The state is. It says they bear not the sword in vain. Why? That's to cut off their head. So, 
Now there's a point at which a, a, a child is responsible for, for his own actions. Even if you did a terrible job of raising them, uh, somewhere along the line they become responsible. I can't blame everything on my parents. You know, you can try, but it, it, it's not going to fly with God. I can make my own decisions, and I can, I can, I got my own free will, and I can decide to do things different. A lot of times we don't. You know, as it says, the twig is bent, so grows the tree. And that's, 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 that's why you want to you do the best you can to raise your children right, get them saved early, get them in church, uh, teach them some things, teach them to love God, not love the church, not love uh, uh, the preacher, uh, love God, love the Bible, everything else secondary after that. And if they'll do that, they'll have this knowledge of him, and they won't be able to just easily walk away from him. It'll keep coming back to them. Uh, train up a child the way that he's old when he's old. Uh, train up a child in the way that he should go when he's old. He'll not depart from it. It's going to be ingrained in him. Okay. Uh, the boys go astray. They're gluttons and drunkards. And uh, when the girls go astray, at Proverbs seven verse ten to twelve, well, they get loose and loud. It says they're loud and stubborn. So it's just one more, the opposite side of the coin there. Uh, they never talk about stoning a, a girl to death. I think, I, think, uh, I think the girls a little bit, they'll see something like that and they'll straighten up. It's these hard-headed boys <laughs> that uh, you got to get through to them. Now there's some, I've met some, some girls that, well, I, I was, uh, well, I can't, I shouldn't say that. Talk about family. <laughs> but, um, yeah, this is just put it this way. I knew some wild girls, and I mean wild, wild. And I'm surprised they survived to be adults. So, anyway, you don't want that. You don't want them. Uh, you don't want them rebellious and stubborn. And a lot of this, you know, a lot of this has to do with with child rearing, but not always. You know. It's hard, it's hard to think that, you know, every time you, find, you see a child that's gone astray that it was ultimate or, or it had to be the parent's fault. I don't know that I believe that. Not every time. I think there are, there are exceptions to anything. And um, the other thing is that, you know, by the time you realize what you should have done, well, it's kind of it's too late. You thought, well, maybe if I'd have done this, you know, Parents go into this thing kind of blind, except for a Bible. And that's what you have to stick to. And you have to believe what God says about the thing. You have to believe what he says about corporal punishment. You have to believe what he says about the human heart, about human nature. You have to believe him. You have to believe what he says about instructing your children. Constantly. Putting the word in them. Doesn't always work, I don't think. I'm, you know... I think that uh, the most important thing you can do is try to win them just as early as you can. At least, tell you what, unsaved, they're, they're, you know, the minute they hit those teenage years, you're in for a rough ride. But if you can get them saved before they hit those teenage years, man, I'm telling you, at least you got you and God. I mean, you've got God inside them. And that, that's, an, that's an important uh, development there. Stop them from getting messed up in the head, too, I think. All right, uh, you know what? I'm going to stop right there because this one's going to be rather long. We're going we're to talk about Ahab and Jezebel. Two peas in a pod. So, huh? yeah. Yeah, I did a psychoanalysis on Jezebel. Man, <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll deal with them next week and uh, a few others. Um, then we'll talk about just some certain things that uh, it, the Bible doesn't necessarily say this is a mental illness uh, but it tells you that the individual is completely and totally unstable and we'll talk about a few of those things um, yeah I don't want to run late today because we have a baptism I hope he's going to be here no word okay if not you guys will have a great we'll have a great picnic and all right any questions about what we covered? Okay, let's take a break.